<laughs> okay, Dan, do, do you want to introduce your speaker? I asked uh, Hutch Harnberger when we invited him if there was anyone in the community he'd like to have as our guest, and he said yes, ask Joan Capura to come, so she really should split this money with us. <laughs> Three ways. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce Hugh Harnsberger, better known as Hutch, a longtime uh, friend of mine and longtime resident and the community activist in Marin County. Hutch spent the first 16 years of his life in China as the son of Protestant missionaries. He came to this country at age 16 for the first time, said it was a big shock, uh, to attend William and Mary College where he met his wife Doris. Then that was in Ford, graduated in 43, went right into the Navy. He's going to be telling us about some of his experiences. After the war, a PhD in chemistry from Berkeley. And uh, then 31 years, a very distinguished career with Chevron, Chevron Research. The last five years of his career with Chevron, he spent scouring the world looking for new technology for Chevron to invest in. Uh, his wife and Doris, uh, they have four children, 10 grandchildren. The two of them were very instrumental in founding the Ross Valley Ecumenical Housing, which operates Tam House, of which Ross Valley Club is a is a member. His talk topic today will be uh, the Battle of Iwo Jima Revisited. Let's have a warm rotary welcome for Hutch Harnberg. <laughs> Four children that uh, Dan just mentioned that Doris and I have are sons. <clears throat> and if you ask any one of our four scattered sons, what does close call mean to you? And every one of them will say, yes, we remember. Those were stories that Dad told us, uh, bedtime <laughs> stories, by the way, uh, about his actual and also fictional experiences on Iwo Jima. <laughs> Initially, my wife Doris didn't know that we were doing this, <clears throat> and uh, she eventually got over being appalled. Uh, the, the, the boys turned out okay, by the way, so I guess I didn't ruin them. <clears throat> to make sense out of what I'm trying to pass on to you today, you need to know a little bit about my China background, but I hope I won't tell you very much. Dan has already said I was raised there in the central coastal part of China, uh, 1930s particularly. Uh, and it's an unusual upbringing to say the least, but I want, want you to know that I got used to war uh, very early. In China, there was some kind of civil war or warlord disturbance going on most of the time. You had to be very alert uh, to to uh, uh, stay alive. The big war, though, came in the 1930s uh, when Japan invaded uh, China and with the, with the objective of plundering uh, the country and no other objective, by the way. And this led eventually to some very unusual experiences uh, for all of us, including my family. I'll just mention we were refugees for two months uh, running from the Japanese army uh, our, our home was lived in by a Japanese colonel and his staff, and they burned it down when they left. Uh, uh, I was a high schooler uh, aiming at uh, uh, souvenir hunting uh, in the, outside of Shanghai, big war there. And coming back from that experience, I didn't know I was going to be the witness. I was on a bicycle, and I didn't know I was going to be the witness the Japanese army bayoneting large numbers of Chinese who would not clear the track uh, going into a checkpoint uh, because a switch engine was coming through. War is very ugly. It's very brutal, and sometimes it's even uh, worse than that. <clears throat> the reason I tell you these things, uh, really, uh, one last thing I wanted to tell you was that, very sad thing, I think, my parents uh, worked in China 35 years or so, and those Chinese families who were closest to my family 
in China were systematically executed uh, later on during the war. They were executed by the Japanese. Uh, this is a very rough kind of a family experience to go through. And all, the only reason I'm telling you these things is to say that I was motivated uh, after I came to the U.S. and after Pearl Harbor. <coughs> Uh, I have two brothers, they were also in the Navy, and uh, uh, like many of you, we were involved uh, very personally in that war. I got through college as quickly as I could and uh, uh, went to the Navy Japanese Language School at the University of Colorado Berkeley. That lasted a little more than a year, a very intense study. I was classified as a translator, not much of an interpreter. Uh, coming out of that, I worked at Pearl Harbor at the U.S. Navy headquarters, a pretty benign existence to say the least. You, if somebody gives you various kinds of papers and so on and you, and you do the job of uh, translating them and turning out reports and whatnot. And therefore the subject of Iwo Jima is a violent uh, departure from what was my real life. I volunteered to go out on a mission and I, I had the uh, probably misfortune overall to uh, draw Iwo Jima. I went there with 5th Marine Division uh, as a lone uh, code investigator. <clears throat> My purpose today in making a few comments is to give you a little bit of the feeling of what uh, being in an amphibious operation, particularly that operation of Iwo Jima was like, and then uh, I want to tell you about two specific experiences. <clears throat> When you're going on a landing, you go over the side of a ship, on, down on a net, a small pack, and they put people, men into LCVPs, which are landing craft, about as many as can physically get in there. They all stand up and don't take up too much room. It's about 70 men, and 10 boats go in together. Uh, we were nine miles offshore, and then another wave forms behind them, and they go in as rapidly as they can organize that whole thing. Uh, that put 700, and, uh, 700 men on shore with every wave. I was with wave 27 going in on the morning of Iwo Jima. Here's the thing I want you to understand. Uh, landing on Iwo Jima was a totally chaotic experience. You could not see six feet. This is the result of the fact that in active war there's a tremendous dust storm that is created and it seems like it's just permanent. Uh, the sound level, not only in landing, but for the next seven or eight days is indescribably high. I lost a good portion of my hearing on Iwo Jima. So did I think most of the other, whatever it was, 50,000 survivors of Iwo Jima, believe me. And the rest of them lost a great deal more than that. As you know, the casualties were the heaviest of any conflict of, of, of World War II. <clears throat> I want to mention the critical role of the beach master in an amphibious landing. Tremendously courageous people who stand on the back of an LST 24 hours a day with floodlights on them so that they're perfect targets and try to manage the traffic on the beach. I remember particularly the third beach master and, and later on happened to meet up with him after the war was over. Most famous experience on Iwo Jima for anyone is the raising of the flag on Mount Suribachi. Uh, it was my division, the 5th Marine Division, 28th Regiment that captured the volcano and put the flag up on the fourth day of uh, Iwo Jima. The battle was by no means over with the taking of that volcano, but the significance of it was that the, the side fire, you might say, that came from that volcano from hundreds of guns of different caliber was silenced. And then we could try to proceed with what was the rest of the campaign. <coughs> I want you to know that the most profound experience I drew out of my experience on Iwo Jima was in fact the saving of two lives. One of these was a, a Japanese-American uh, 
army translator that went in with us from day one. The Marines could not understand how a person who looks Japanese could be wearing a U.S. Army uniform. The second was a Japanese Army Sergeant Major who happened to surrender uninjured, and it was very unusual. You got to understand that on Iwo Jima, they had no intentions of taking prisoners, and we didn't either. Last item I want to mention generally is the U.S. Navajo Indian Marines. They call themselves the Code Talkers. I don't know whether you've heard of this before. The Marines had a, a Navajo Marine at each of their major Marine headquarters, division, regiment, and also battalion. Not the, not the combat companies up on the line. And the military commands and communications back and forth were made in Navajo with their corresponding number at the other end translating it back into English. These were highly qualified people because they had to be extremely fluent in English. They played a very key role in many of our Pacific campaigns, at least those were the Marines. And as far as we know, Japanese never figured out what in the world those guys were saying. <laughs> I got on the island the morning of the invasion of Iwo Jima. I've already mentioned what it was like generally. I spent two to three hours probably just going around in a small circle and trying, mainly trying to stay alive. It was a very, very difficult thing to do. A uh, tremendous amount of fire. I finally got to a location where uh, I asked one of the Marines who was, I, I found there, is this where the headquarters company of the 5th Marine Division is supposed to be? And his answer to me, I'll never forget, was, God, are they here yet? And if you don't understand what I mean, a, a headquarters company of a Marine or Army division is commanded by a general. The generals don't come in that early. Another Marine standing nearby realized that I was 21 years old, and it was pretty obvious that I didn't know what I was either doing or and I had no previous experience, and that was certainly true. And he said, why don't you dig a hole? <laughs> we, we all carried the little fold-up shovels that you have carried on camping trips if you've never been on an amphibious campaign. I said, Caleb, uh, uh, I don't know how I could be jovial at that point, but I, I think I was. And I said, why don't we dig a hole big enough for two guys? This seemed like an innovative idea, and, and, and he said, yeah, sure, let's do that, and we did. Uh, I didn't know who he was. He was quite a bit older than I, 15 years older, I think. Marine captain with headquarters company. After about uh, seven or eight days, we'll pass over those. They were very hard days indeed, even at headquarters company. This man, whom I had just gotten barely acquainted with, pulled out from some filthy clothes in our hole a battered, beat up guitar. <laughs> and uh, he sat in the middle of this hole and began to play. He played very well. And he also sang. 
And I mostly listened, I think, at first, but then I said, his name was Halsey, and I said, Halsey, I sing too. And I said, if you will sing either some stuff I know or teach me the words, we didn't have any music, uh, we can sing harmony together. And the end of that experience overall was that gradually, it didn't happen right away, Gradually, over a period of 15 or 20 days, he and I led singing in headquarters company every night until they had lights out and nobody do anything, which is usually 8 o'clock at night, by the way. No smoking, no nothing. I obviously turned to this man later on and said, how is it that you know all these songs, ballads, Irish songs, spirituals, hymns? Uh, I mean, he knew definitely more than I did, but I, I held on pretty well. And he told me he was born and raised in China in a Presbyterian missionary family as I was. <clears throat> Let me tell you about my work on Iwo Jima. I've been shown how, how to recognize Japanese coded material. By the way, it's not in Japanese. I was a Japanese linguist, but coded material is five numbers, five numbers, five numbers, five numbers numbers in rows and columns, just like the U.S. code printout. So if I could ever find anything that looked like that, that would be significant. Or code books, or code machines. I didn't know exactly how to proceed with my work. Uh, they didn't tell me how to do it. They told me what to do. Go find it. And gradually, as the war moved across the airfield, we were right next to the airfield, and up onto the next uh, level, uh, I decided the best thing to try to do was to go and get acquainted with the marine line companies of my division. And gradually, on a day-by-day -day basis, from literally sunrise to sunset, which is about 11 hours, that's what I did. And I would, uh, got acquainted, and I would ask them, tell them why I was there, and I was the only one doing this kind of stuff. You guys finding this stuff like this? Get in touch with me and so on, so on, so on, so on. I never found a thing. It was the hardest work probably I ever did in my life, like under very trying circumstances, and very vulnerable. I should not be here now, obviously, because I was with marine line companies every day, all day. I had tremendous experience in going down underground. Uh, Iwo Jima was honeycombed with tunnels, rooms, passageways, side passageways. You could go anywhere you wanted underground if you were willing to stand the gaff of the corpses and, and all the other and the phosphorus grenades and all the other things that go on down there. I never found a thing. Until one morning, towards the end of March, 1945, I was with one of these line companies already, 7.15 in the morning, drinking coffee with them. And when I had just gotten to that point, the captain, whose name was King, of that company was very excited because he said, we have our first prisoner. And he said, I won't repeat exactly what he said, but he said, you know how to talk this uh, stuff, and come over here, and uh, I'm gonna ask this guy uh, uh, questions having to do with just the area where the, that line company operated. And we did that. How many people are over there causing all that firefight that's going on right there? The guy said, I don't know. Well, how about over here where a tank is trying to blow the hillside away? <laughs> there it is. He said, I, and then it was, he responded, but all he ever said was, I don't know. I have been underground for six weeks, and I don't know anything. 
the captain turned to me and said, he's yours. And he's, he also said he was worthless. <laughs> he was worthless to the Marine Line Company. Yes, that's true. I protested. I'm a Navy lieutenant. I carried a 45, but I didn't know how to personally handle a prisoner. I never had. He said, he's yours. He would not take any back talk. Uh, company commanders are tremendous, by the way. And the Marines are marvelous, marvelous fighters. But he said, you get out of here. Take the prisoner with you. Uh, I sat down nearby with the prisoner. We were having a cup of coffee. And I tried to get acquainted with him. We could talk together in Japanese. He was responsive. He was, you could tell right away, he was intelligent. He was educated. I think I could say all of that just from just a little bit with him. But what I asked was, I said, aren't you a sergeant major in the Japanese Army? Looking at his sleeve here. You know what a sergeant major looks like in the U.S. Army, the, the, the emblem? It covers the whole damn thing with your shoulder to your elbow. But it, chevrons and all that, the Japanese copy the U.S. and they, they have something about like that too. How did you get to be a sergeant major in the Japanese Army? You just, you said you were 21 years old, just like me. You just graduated from Tokyo University, the number one university of Japan then and now. And he said, uh, I've been in the service about a year. He didn't really answer me. And then I said, what did you do? He said, I ran the code room of the island headquarters. <laughs> and he said, if you'll save my life, uh, this war is over. He said, I would help to get it over and even work with you guys. <clears throat> this was early in the morning. I had one of the hardest days of my life trying to get back to division headquarters, which was uh, five miles away, and I had the colonel's jeep. Because I had to report in at different levels, uh, regiment, battalion, so on, and all those guys had to go through their thing before you could move. <laughs> but also, people up there knew me on the line. I spent all my life there in that time, and another uh, uh, Marine lieutenant yelled at me early, early that morning saying, come over here and help us try to talk these guys out, uh, just into surrendering, or we're going to close up the place, a bloodshot. And I had observed a lot of this already. The prisoner and I, together, and he was not restrained, spent two to three hours, now you may say this is a little long, but we were persistent, trying to talk some people that were right down below us. You don't get in the front, by the way, because they throw grenades out at you and all, or they will shoot you uh, while you're talking. We got very proficient at this. You stay in a protected way. Trying to talk these Japanese army out of uh, just dying. Suicide, in other words. You have to lay down your weapons. I don't know how many times we said this. You have to come out separately and to surrender. We will feed you. We will take care of your wounds. We will repatriate you to your homeland, if there's any homeland left. Because Japan was flattened at the time. We do not kill prisoners. Since I'd observed that happening a number of times. I, I can still remember how hard it was to say that. At the end of that total experience, he and I, well, one more thing, lovely comment. The Japanese prisoner said, the, the Navy lieutenant tells the truth. Everything he is saying, he tells the truth. 
He said, he saved my life. And he will save yours. They came out single file, led by a warrant officer with his sword raised high and all holding their weapons right in front of their nose. They were all shot immediately. When I got back to the division headquarters, I think it was four or five o'clock in the afternoon, I reported into the G2 colonel, G2 is intelligence. And you understand so far, I've reported to him many times as a total failure. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing. And then I told him I had what I considered one of the most important prisoners of World War II in my hands. It didn't take much convincing for him to get excited, call in a PBM, it was getting dark on the ocean, and take the prisoner out on a rubber boat. I never saw him again. I heard later that he worked with the U.S. Fleet, fleet radio unit, which was stationed at Tracy, with big antennas, uh, to help monitor Japanese communications until the war was over. His speculation to me is what happened to him. I think he's a very significant person. I suspect he's, I would certainly suspect he's in the U.S. today. And I would think he's probably the recently retired president of Hitachi USA. <laughs> Let me conclude by at least saying what I think was the significance of Iwo Jima, and not just my experiences, believe me. Capturing Iwo Jima <laughs> meant later on that about 20,000 U.S. airmen dropped down on the island and did not drop in the ocean. Most of their lives were saved. About 2,000 B-29 bombers came down on Iwo Jima. I saw the I saw a lot of them, but I saw the first one come in with only one wheel down and making a crash landing. It provided the U.S. a much closer bomber base to Japan, halfway between Saipan, where the general here uh, was, uh, had just taken over Saipan of six months before Iwo Jima. And the most important thing of all, as I've read about the subject more recently, I was a history minor and a, and a chemistry major in college, people. Uh, Iwo Jima very definitely speeded the end of World War II. There's no question about it. And no matter what you read about this subject, I'll tell you this. The ending of World War II, which is only five months after Iwo Jima by then, you had to go through Okinawa, for example. We saved a ton of lives, not only U.S. lives, which is the ones that we count so dearly, but probably 10 or 20 times that number of Japanese lives. Last comment I want to make is if you go to the Marines Memorial in Arlington, Virginia today, obviously it is an oversized memorial uh, to the raising of the flag on uh, Iwo Jima. You will see on the uh, Marines Memorial the, the slogan from uh, a comment that was made by Admiral Nimitz upon having the report that Iwo Jima is, is secure, the island is secure. And his victory comment was, uncommon valor was a common virtue. <coughs> I don't know whether you know or not, but Iwo Jima had 27 Congressional Medals of Honor, the highest number given in any conflict, as I understand it, uh, any single conflict or single battle uh, in the history of the U.S. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, got a bottle of rotary wine for you here. Thank you very much. The new, the new case, Tabernacle Silver Wine. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Try a question or two if you have it. Okay.
much to cover. Uh, <laughs> the, the U.S. Army Japanese translator came in the morning of the landing on Iwo Jima, and what I did was uh, guide him uh, to where we eventually wound up in headquarters company. He was supposed to go to the same place I was, but the, he was under constant threat of being shot. I said, you stay so close to me that, that you can't, you can't there's, there's no space between us. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the same thing happened with, with the Japanese Army prisoner, exactly. Marines kept telling me over and over again, stand aside, Lieutenant. How do you like that? Stand aside, Lieutenant. I grabbed Marine enlisted men. I don't know whether this is legal, by the way, in the U.S. military. I grabbed Marine enlisted men by their shirt right here. I said, you shoot this prisoner. And I have your neck, and I have a big enough voice that it works. Ellen, did you have a question? How big an island is it? Iwo Jima is a kind of a, uh, <coughs> what do you call it, uh, papaya uh, uh, shaped, shaped island, about eight miles long, about five miles in the fattest uh, section. And the volcano happens to be down at the uh, southern tip. We landed on the east east beaches uh, on this side. Okay. Well, thanks very much.